You are watching the press preview of First Look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the political commentator Benedict Spence and the writer and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Daily Mirror completely ignores its defeat in the High Court today over Prince Harry's phone hacking claims and leads instead with exclusive news that the BBC is axing the quiz show a question of sport after 53 years. And there's very little mention on any other front page. The Sun speaks to the grandmother of Alex Batty, the boy who turned up after going missing for six years, who tells of her joy at hearing his voice. The Financial Times says Western nations may seize Russian central bank assets to fund Ukraine's war effort, as the US and Europe look like cutting their own financial support. The Telegraph says London Mayor Sadiq Khan has blocked a plan to send cars to Ukraine that would otherwise have been scrapped for failing to comply with ultra-low emissions standards. The Times has been looking at GP waiting times and reports that millions more people are now waiting over a month to see their doctor. The Eye has uh, seen data suggesting that more than one in five fixed-rate mortgage deals are due to come to an end next year and are expected to leave their 1.5 million holders financially worse off. Half-price Christmas, that's the front of the Daily Mail, but says major stores are already holding big sales to try to shift unsold stock before Christmas. The Star is outraged at the opinion of some boffins that the humble potato isn't good enough to call itself a vegetable. So what should it call itself? A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Benedict Spence and Amy Nicole Turner. Welcome to both of you. Um, you all know that we're not going to be discussing the humble uh, spud, uh, first of all. We're going to be looking at the Telegraph uh, front page. And um, their headline there, Piers Morgan, Harry is on a mission to destroy the monarchy. Those were the words that, that he delivered in defence on his uh, doorstep following the court's judgment. Benedict. Yes, and I mean, this is, uh, it must be said that this is a part of a narrative, I suppose, that has been uh, uh, discussed at great length, I suppose, by, by, by Piers Morgan. And, you know, th this case has been going on for a very long time. The, the, the crux of the story is that uh, just under half of the, uh, the claims that were brought, uh, the judge found, it, it agreed with uh, Prince Harry, 15 of the 33. So not, not a complete sort of a slam dunk, but still rather a lot of uh, erroneous doings, uh, shall we say, uh, at the Mirror Group. They welcome it. They say that it gives them an opportunity to go forward. Obviously, Piers Morgan uh, very staunchly and very fiercely denies that he was ever engaged in phone hacking or that he ever instructed anybody to do so. But as I say, this also, with regards to Piers Morgan, it does play into, I think, what has been quite a common theme of his uh, recently, which is this sort of to and fro uh, between himself and the Duke and Duchess. Of course, it all sort of stems back to a, a, an early friendship, a failed friendship with, with uh, Meghan Markle. And, you know, it's... I understand it. It's, it gets a lot of people very interested, this sort of royal drama, um, this sort of tittle-tattle celebrity sort of gossip. It is very interesting, but also, broadly, what we're talking about here is trust. New, you know, newspapers trade not just on information, but also on trust. Uh, people go to them because they trust the information that they're given. 15 of 33 is, as I say, it's not all of them, but it's a substantial amount. And it's one of those things where if you begin to lose the trust um, of your readership or of other people that you might be interacting with, it can be very hard to get that back. Now, the phone hacking story has been ongoing for a very long time in this country. It has done a lot of damage, I think, to the reputation of certain organisations um, and their relationship with uh, perhaps not the public so much, but certainly a lot of people in the public eye. I think a lot of people who consider themselves in the public eye have had to change perhaps their behaviour, how they interact with the press. Once trust like that is shattered, it's very hard to get it back and a lot of work has to be done to get it back. And I think that that's a very damaging thing for a newspaper to have to come out and admit that this is the case. Mm. And Amy, how, how significant do you think this ruling is? Um, Prince Harry himself saying that he, he feels vindicated and actually even going as far as saying that uh, the fight doesn't end here. I think this is a monumental day for Prince Harry because 
the main thing is this was never about money for him. He could have settled, but he didn't. He saw it through. And he was one of four test cases speaking on behalf of 100 claimants today. Um, Prince Harry has completely shown that just because something is of interest to the public does not mean it's in the public, it's not in the public interest. And the things that he went through as a young man between the ages of 10 to 18, a lot of it... And the, it, it, it is shocking when you read his victim impact statement. Now, Piers Morgan was the editor of The Mirror for, um, I think, two years. And so he was overseeing the stories coming in. Um, for a large portion of these. Uh, they picked 33 out of uh, possible hundreds to really scrutinise and look over. And I think it, the, you put too much emphasis on the burden of proof that they only needed to find evidence in maybe one or two to prove this situation. But Piers Morgan is adamant that he didn't know anything was going on, despite being the editor at the time, which I find quite remarkable, considering now a High Court judge has ruled that it's very likely that he did know, yet he's still standing tough and claiming that Harry's on a mission to destroy the monarchy, when Harry is clearly on a mission to, to find out properly what happened to him as a young man, which impacted his mental health, his friendships, his whole life. And I think he's finally putting to bed what he went through and finding some closure on that. Um, which is really, really important. But Piers Morgan, as you say, um, denying that he knew anything of, of the sort was going on under his uh, tenure. Let's move on to the Times world um, and this development in the uh, Israel-Hamas war. The Israeli hostages that have been killed in, in so-called friendly fire, Benedict. Yeah, it's a, it's a dreadful story, uh, you know, given that uh, a large part of the reason why Israel has committed such huge military resources to its operation in Gaza is explicitly to liberate these people. Uh, and the knowledge that these three young men won't be coming back home uh, because of an unfortunate accident, unclear right now, by their captors or whether or not they had escaped from their captors. Either way, they were identified by the IDF as a potential threat, and this has resulted in a tragedy. If one were to be sort of hard-hearted, I suppose, or sort of hard-nosed, rather, one would say that accidents like this are always likely to happen in any war zone, let alone one as quite as congested as the Gaza Strip, which, as everybody knows, very small amount of territory, a lot of high-rise buildings, a lot of sort of rabbit warrens, a lot of tunnels. It must be a very difficult situation. Um, for, you know, a war zone is always a difficult situation, but an especially difficult situation for the IDF and everybody else currently involved in that situation. That is why, of course, everybody's been reacting with such horror to the scenes that we have been seeing. Um, but I just think at this moment in time, just a real moment of tragedy amidst what has otherwise been considered a rather, a, a rather effective military operation, this then hits you home. It doesn't always go your way. You don't get everybody back, and dreadful things like this do happen. Mm. And Amy, also a journalist killed uh, as well. But this will play very difficultly for... Um, there'll be great difficulty for Benjamin Netanyahu because there were families of the hostages that were marching in Israel uh, saying that uh, Netanyahu was more concerned about the war against Hamas rather than freeing the hostages. And now that we have these deaths under so-called friendly fire, the anger of those families will only be more intense. I think the, the families of the hostages are completely within their rights to be... to, to, to have had concerns since the, since the bombing began, because surely it would have made sense to get those hostages out as a priority. However, I want to just um, take you up on a word you used there. Mm. Li the, the, they're liberating the people of the Gaza. No, no, liberating the hostages. Oh, sorry. Um, but you're saying it's been it's been effective. It has been so far. thus far. The military operation has actually been the very military effective. operation is, has been yes. effective. There's See, no that, there's I... there's no question when you look at what the military objectives are. A significant number of hostages have been freed. You know we shouldn't take away from that. A lot of people who many people probably wouldn't have been expecting to get back have been got back. And in terms of Hamas's uh, command centres in the north of Gaza, yes, it has been very effective. I, there I, has been a huge but those, civilian, those, those there have been huge civilian casualties. There have been huge there have been huge civilian casualties. 
casualties. Yes, but the ceasefire came into effect because of the effectiveness of Israel's operation. Hamas did not expect. Hamas took the evidence of the 2005 war in the north of the country with Lebanon and also the evidence of what happened uh, in Ukraine, actually, in, in the Azov-style siege and thought it would have a much better time of siege warfare than it has actually had. Israel has been preparing for this, though, for about 15 years and they have proven very effective. That is what was able to bring Hamas to the table, given that all of the rhetoric about Hamas uh, was all about opposition. It was all about uprising. It was all about strength. Israel brought them to the table a lot faster than they Can, thought would happen. I, I just need to ask you, though, mm -hmm. would you say that it has been effective when we've had the number of civilian casualties? We won't. That I mean, I, that's always a very difficult question because civilians always die in war. Hang I on a minute, Benedict, no, no, wait no, a no, second. No, no, no. I, I, the, question was, the, the question was addressed to me, so I will answer it. The key thing to remember is there is no such thing as a war that is completely sans civilian casualties. Show me the one that exists, it doesn't. And you are foolish if you believe such a thing is possible. It is always going to be a tragedy that many, many people die. I don't think anybody wants to see civilians dying, but nobody wanted to see Israelis being taken hostage see, into Gaza. Nobody wanted to see Israelis being murdered as they were by Hamas in the build-up. We need to remember that. We won't be able to ascertain exactly how successful this has been until after the operation but has that ceased. Is I'll let Amy come in. We'll acknowledge that, that America has said that the, the casualties are far exceeding what's at Joe acceptable. Biden has to in say that because his base wants to hear Amy, that. come in. Um, I, I cannot see how you can, on one hand, quote that 19,000 civilians have died and then deem that a success or effective in any way. I think that takes away from the humanitarian absolute chaos and tragedy. That is How a, many for, German so, civilians died but this, no, in the Second World it, War? It, it, can you, it, can you it, tell me? It, it is a completely non-comparable situation to have a strip too, of land that is occupied. Would you say that that was an unsuccessful You've war? Got, that is a sovereign nation, a sovereign nation. This is a very different circumstance. I don't the see the this Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. They have no means of leaving the Strip, so they are. So okay. was Dresden, and we set it on no fire. no means we, of we leaving. Could, we could continue. I just want to get one more, more story in before the break, and that is the uh, Alex Batty story um, and his grandmother. Uh, very happy to hear his voice today. The Sun's covering this. It's on their front page. Benedict. It's, it's a rare good news story, I suppose. It's very often when, you know, we hear stories of children going missing, young people going missing, you do assume the worst, and we're always told there's a very narrow window in which to find, uh, to find them. This, it turns out, was his mother and, I believe, his grandfather who abducted him um, and took him to live in this sort of this commune. It's been called a sort of a hippie cult. I don't know if that's entirely accurate. A, a community set. I'm not quite sure we can say abducted, actually. Well, I think that that is how I read it um, phrased somewhere they, they else. If, a, if we're not, if we're not going to say that, then that's yes, fine. That's certainly how I heard it phrased. I think, I think it's a very positive thing that he has been found, that he has come home and that he gets a chance to rebuild relationships with people, many of whom I suspect would have thought they would never get the opportunity to do that. So I think we mm. should welcome that. It's a rare good news yes, story. Yes, it is. You're right in, in that respect, definitely. Ben Dick and Amy, thank you very much for the moment. We are going to take a break coming up. People are waiting as long as a month to see their GP, but thankfully you only have to wait three and a half minutes until the press preview returns. Uh, do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, Benedict Spence and Amy Nicole Turner. Let's take a look at the Times, their front page story about the the rise in the number of of people waiting uh, a month just to uh, to get in to see their their GP. And they quoting a private health insurer here, Vitality. They said that 40% of claims were now for private GP consultations, up from 4% in 2015. Benedict. I think it's become an on-running theme now of how things are going in this country, is that all sort of aspects of NHS care don't work. This is all of a sort of a knock-on effect, I think, that started with the pandemic when certain, you know, the number of people that were being seen for all sorts of things just went down. Uh, and now, you know, what with the on-running uh, battles we've had between the government and uh, various staff cohorts within the NHS, you, we're all seeing the end results, and that is that it's simply not working. now. Uh, the reasons as to why that is, I think, are very obvious. Lots of people are leaving the NHS to go overseas because the conditions are better. That obviously leads to staff shortages. Uh, people feel that the conditions aren't very good. More money needs to be found. How that money is used uh, also needs to be addressed. And this is the thing, is that, you know, we can, we can make the claim that the government has not handled this well. It's not. Um, but the NHS itself has not handled itself very well with the funds that it does get. It does actually get a very large amount of, of funding. So relatively. it's the fault of the NHS? I don't think it's entirely the 
fault of the NHS, but I absolutely do think that the NHS could use its funds a little bit better. And I think also how uh, we go about uh, retaining staff is very important. Now, what is required here is not a blame game where you have one side saying it's entirely the other person's fault. You do need the government to come to the table and lead the way it is the government. Uh, but I think aspects of the NHS also need to be less opposed to reform. And we're seeing that now with the Labour Party, uh, with Wes Streeting going around the world to Singapore, to Australia, and saying actually they do things a lot better here based around data, based around AI, and we need to be incorporating these new techniques into speeding up the services. And I mean, right there, month-long wait to see your GP, that's unacceptable. Amy? Well, I think you started your timeline a little bit incorrectly there, because I think this is a result, a little um, equal sign of austerity. Austerity measures which then impacted our response to the pandemic and what we're seeing now. Um, you pointed out that there is a massive recruitment re retention problem because we don't pay our doctors enough. That's why they leave to go to Australia. That's why they leave um, f to work elsewhere. Um, but the, you cannot under, you underplay the impact of austerity and what it's ha what the, the effects that it's had on this country. And that is why now we have 7.7 .7 million people stuck on waiting lists. We have millions of people economically inactive because we stripped the NHS of its resources and now we're seeing the consequences of that government policy decision. On that note, I know you want to come back, but we're going to... <laughs> to go to the star. <laughs> You've got about 20 <laughs> seconds to tell us why uh, potatoes are not worthy of being described as vegetables. Do you understand the story? Presumably that's because Mr Potato Head was a bit of an animal. When you came to life, he wasn't just a vegetable. There was something a bit, little bit more vital to him. I have no idea <laughs> what the reason is. It's also, sort of this, is, this is bad because it, the potato is the original superfood, high in vitamin C and a, the cure for scurvy. So maybe it's its own category. This is fake it is news. Above. It's fake above. News. Yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> I guess you have to buy the paper and read Read, read if there's any more to the story. What a spuddy outrage is the headline. Uh, Benedict <laughs> and is. Amy, thank you so much for taking us through the papers.